a baby camel <laughs> a baby camel once asked mother camel why do we have humps mother camel said we need the humps to store water in the desert the baby camel said why are our legs long and our feet rounded mother camel said they are meant for walking in the desert the baby camel said okay then why are our eyelashes long mother camel with pride said those long thick eyelashes are your protective cover they protect your eyes from the sand and the wind in the desert after thinking it over the baby camel said so if the hump is to store water when we are in the desert our long legs and rounded feet are for walking through the desert and our long eyelashes protect our eyes from the desert sand and wind then what are we doing here in the zoo <laughs> our gospel lesson today is just two verses just two verses long mark chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 at once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Temptation. As Fred Craddock put it, one can hardly think of a more appropriate consideration for the first Sunday of Lent. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Have you ever heard so much of significance crammed into so small a space? Spirit at the beginning, angels at the end, Satan and testing and wild animals in the desert in the middle. Lamar Williamson, who was one of my professors, wondered if testing is part of God's pedagogy. You know, if so, then this story is as much about us as it is about Jesus. God tests us like he did Jesus to, to make us stronger. That's what he meant by divine pedagogy. There is a scene in Downton Abbey's season three where Lady Edith is jilted at the altar. She runs back to the abbey and uh, up to her room where her mother finds her and tries to console her. And Cora says, you know what they say, being tested only makes you stronger. And Edith tearfully replies, I don't think it's working with me. <laughs> Jack Kingsbury, another one of my professors, says we are meant to see in this story a cosmic dimension to this encounter between Jesus and Satan. Heaven is the abode of God. The desert is the abode of Satan. And just as Israel spent 40 years in the desert, so Jesus spends 40 days in the desert. In testing Jesus, Satan endeavors to entice him to break faith with God and to, to forfeit his sonship and his authority. But Jesus withstands Satan. Jesus' struggle with Satan is a clash between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of evil. In the temptation, Jesus shows what his ministry will be about. It's the binding of Satan and the inauguration of the end time age of salvation. All of that is to say it may not be about us at all. But which is it? 
Which is it? It seems to me that what we have here is a text that has a definite purpose within the gospel and which also functions quite nicely as a paradigm for our lives. Let me break it down into some of its parts. First of all, the Spirit sent him out into the desert, or the wilderness, that place on the eastern side of the Jordan River where John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It was a, it was a place of, of indeterminate geographical location but of profound theological significance. The, the desert is one of those words, one of those terms that, that should always catch our ear. When anything happens in the desert, there are a multitude of associations we are supposed to remember. Jesus spending 40 days there, Israel's 40 years in the wilderness, Moses 40 days in the wilderness on Mount Sinai, Elijah's 40-day trip to Mount Horeb through the wilderness, and on and on and on it goes. And it's inevitable that we, that we ponder Mark's gospel as a sort of a, sort of a new exodus, that as Israel experienced God in passing through the waters of the Red Sea only to encounter the trials and tests in the wilderness, so Jesus, still wet from the Jordan, is plunged in to the desert. Who hasn't plunged into the desert? Even if it's our own doing, who hasn't plunged into the desert? The sad reality is that the wilderness, like it or not, is where we live our lives. It's that place between certainty and doubt. It's between hope and fear, between promises made and promises kept. The promised land is out there, but we live in the desert. For Jesus, the wilderness was where he found his voice and his vocation. And when he emerged 40 days later, his words echoed those of John, the kingdom of God has come near and repent and believe. But the desert is where we live. Secondly, temptation. Temptation. Wasn't it Oscar Wilde who said, I can resist anything except temptation? Pierazzo. Pierazzo is the Greek word to tempt or to test. And there are various possible meanings for this term. But the two most probable, the one that we are familiar with, are enticement to sin and putting to the test. Every other usage of this word of this verb, pirazzo, in Mark's gospel, every other usage in chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 12, speaks of putting to the test. And there is no reference to enticement to sin. And this is surely the intention of chapter 113. It's a test of strength between Jesus and Satan. But even so, even so, it's impossible to read this text without personalizing it, isn't it? Now, unless you've attended a Jesuit high school or grew up Roman Catholic, I doubt that you've ever heard of Augustine's psychology of temptation. He understood temptation to have three parts three phases, three components. Protestants aren't real good about this sort of thing. Augustine said that temptation begins with suggestion. It's followed by pleasure and finally consent. Suggestion consists in the proposal of some evil. We find ourselves attracted to some forbidden fruit. Pleasure follows suggestion as we are drawn toward the suggested wrong. In other words, the more we think about it, the more we kind of like the idea. But finally, 
if we willingly consent, then sin is committed. The suggestion itself is not sin. Even the pleasure we might take in contemplating it is not sin. Desire for sin is not sin itself. Consent is the key. And even so, if you read much moral theology, you find all sorts of caveats to consent. <laughs> is it as imperfect? Was there hesitation? Was it resisted even half-heartedly? And so on and so on. In the same way that, that the desert was meant to call to mind the exodus and the Israelites wandering in the desert, Jesus being tested by Satan is meant to remind us of Satan testing Job. Job who was innocent, who endured, and who was blessed. Jesus too, innocent, endured, and was blessed. And it really isn't supposed to remind us of our own temptations, we who are not so innocent. A third component of this, the animals. The animals. I love this. The wild animals. Only in Mark do we find this. Not in Matthew or Luke or John. Only here. Now Mark's gospel begins by citing a verse from Isaiah. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. And so it isn't a stretch to think that Mark's reference to wild animals might remind us of another passage from Isaiah. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and a little child shall lead them. Only, only Isaiah mixes wild animals with domesticated animals and here in Mark, they're all wild. They're all wild. Williamson says the beasts belong to the realm of the desert, the wilderness, to, to untamed places. Kingsbury sees the reference to wild animals with Jesus and with angels as a flashback to Eden as it should have been or, or perhaps as it will someday be. But both commentators fail to point out that the wild animals and the angels coexist in the same space. And that the spirit and Satan and Jesus are right there in the midst of them. We need more than a little dash of honesty about the life that Jesus lived. About the life he calls us to live. Jesus' life was full of adversity and suffering and defeat. He did not replace all unjustly earthly rulers or lift all the lowly and oppressed. The 2,000 years that have passed since seem to have brought very little change as well. In this morning's paper, we read of needless deaths, of unending violence, of innocent suffering, of justice denied. And all around us are those who lack the basic necessities of life, who go hungry or who live in fear, whose grieving is unceasing, whose isolation is unbearable. The wilderness, the desert, really is where we live our lives, where we, where we hurt one another, where we break promises, where we accept lies as truth, where we fail to love our neighbors. The kingdom has not arrived in its fullness. We seem to be stuck year after year, sacred season upon sacred season, purple upon purple, at the very beginning of the gospel. Triumphalism has no place in the Christian faith. And there is no shame in being imperfect. The wilderness is never fully tamed. It's always with us. 
Even in our own private zoos, we have humps on our backs and long legs and rounded feet and eyelashes to protect us from the sand because the desert is always a possibility. Chris Henry, who's the pastor at Shaliford Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, told this story. He said, I attended a book club. The participants were the pastors and lay leaders of local congregations. That day we found ourselves sharing personal stories of faith. One by one, the group described how each had been raised by loving and faithful parents who brought us to Sunday school and church, told us stories of Jesus, and helped us to grow in the faith. Each story sounded something like that until there was only one person left to speak. As tears formed in her eyes, she said, I am a Christian because the church saved my life. Suddenly our chatty group fell silent. And she described how she had been abandoned by her parents as an infant, sent to a foster home, was neglected and abused for most of the first six years of her life. At age seven, she was adopted, and not knowing what to expect, she spent the first night wide awake in her new bed, afraid and anxious. The next morning, a Sunday, the family got up early, had breakfast, and got into the car. She said, it was my first time at church, and I had no idea what to expect. We walked into the Sunday school classroom and the teacher's face lit up. Welcome, Janet. We've been waiting for you. And then she read the Bible story for the day where Jesus said to his disciples, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. I knew with all of my heart that he was talking to me. I knew that I was home. It was a new beginning. It was the kingdom of God in the midst of the desert. There was something about Jesus' experience in the wild. At the threshold between civilization and untamed places that captures our imagination. This really is where we live. And sometimes we see glimpses of God's coming kingdom, but only glimpses. The comfort in this story is that Jesus himself wanders the wilderness alongside us. It's his land too. It's his land too. Let us pray together. Oh God, why do we put expectations of perfection upon ourselves why do we why do we seem so afraid to admit who and what we are when you're there with us on the mountaintops and in the valleys and the desert and everywhere else you are with us may we remember as we journey through Lent in your name we pray amen <laughs>